twenty number two. Okay, so just some housekeeping announcements. Uh, notes already uploaded or posted will be updated. Will be updated. That means that even the earlier parts can be changed, hopefully for the better. Uh, and maybe possibly as soon as this evening or tomorrow morning. Uh, secondly, um, uh, even, even though the notes, I think I have been careful uh, to say that uh, I'm looking at uh, linear algebra, algebraic groups on varieties. Writing on varieties. And varieties, I usually mean a reduced scheme over an algebraically closed field, in this case over C. But in the last lecture, I might have forgotten to say linear. So the point is a linear algebraic group uh, is actually an affine variety. So uh, maps can be talk, talked of purely in terms of uh, functions. So what, okay. So, uh, but in the notes, I, I have been careful to say that uh, we are dealing with whatever I say holds only for linear algebraic uh, groups. And in fact, uh, most of what I say has to do with uh, G reductive, which is an important subclass of linear algebraic groups. Very good. So now the order of business today is that much of today I will spend. Uh, so, so sorry, Ramdas. So yeah. when you can certainly say that subgroups of GLN, there is no problem, right? Where every They're linear algebraic group can be embedded. Over C yeah. can be embedded uh, as a close subgroup of, uh, of yeah. GLN uh, uh, by algebra, you know, uh, by algebraic maps. Okay, yes. there is a, okay, yeah. The point is, I, I see if you don't say linear, uh, if they are not uh, affine varieties, then the theory becomes quite different. Uh -huh. And uh, we have really nothing to say. Uh, okay, that's a, okay. So now much of today will be, uh, it will look as if we are doing a, a sort of review, but I'm going to sort of fold. See, there were several important points which I, uh, glossed over and uh, and people were asking questions in the last lecture where uh, I kind of post I, I I kind of push the answer into the future. So I, in any case, I have to deal with a number of issues. So I'm going to fold these two uh, things together, namely the review. Uh, I will do a quick review. I will highlight the things that have to be. Uh, uh, explained further either because they were postponed or because people ask questions and then I'll spend time uh, on those issues and then I will proceed to the in fact the what should be the central topic of these lectures namely what I call um, um, uh, sort of uh, numerical criteria for uh, for uh, semistability and non-semistability. So these, so the buzzwords here are um, uh, either the moment map or Mumford's, uh, uh, Hilbert Mumford criterion and Mumford's uh, M function, okay? So that I will just begin at the, at the end of the today's lecture and hopefully I'll have, uh, I'll finish the last lecture by saying something meaningful about these. Very good. So. <clears throat> So here is a quick review, plus postponed business. Uh, yes, so this is the quick review. Uh, so I have, uh, I, I deal with G reductive, acting on X affine. And the key fact is that uh, the, the ring of invariant, for invariant um, regular functions on X is finitely generated. Uh, 
सी आर जीरो सो दैट मीन्स दैट इज देर एक्सिस इनवेरियंट ऑल नॉमियल्स ऑल नॉमियल फंक्शंस और रेगुलर फंक्शंस so x is an affine variety so the regular functions i call polynomial functions why don't i just call them regular functions q1 q2 qn where n is some positive integer such that every invariant regular function is an algebraic expression in the qr <clears throat> so that means you take powers products of the qis powers of the qis uh, and add them up with constant uh, complex coefficients you get uh, clearly if since the qis are invariant any such expression any such uh, function that you construct like this is going to be invariant and uh, the claim is that uh, uh, there exists finitely many qi such that any invariant function is constructed this way in other words let me repeat there exists finitely many invariant regular functions q1 to q capital n such that sums of products of powers of these guys uh, with complex coefficients Uh, give you all invariant uh, regular functions so geometrically uh, uh, given a choice of n and q1 to qn such that the above is true we get a map let me call this by hat from x to cn x going to q1x qnx okay now <clears throat> um uh since uh qi are invariant pi hat will be satisfy pi hat of gx is pi hat of x and then it, this is not uh, uh, so in general the map will not be on to on to cn and and this is more subtle is always on to a closed sub variety of cn so that means that the qis will not be algebraically independent they will satisfy some algebraic uh, identities corresponding to what the equation defining this closed sub variety so in, so in other words algebraic identities between the qi correspond to equations defining the image and so as i said that is uh, almost a tautology but the point is Uh, so there will be certain algebraic uh, identities take all possible algebraic identities between the qis so if you impose them on the coordinates of the cn you will get some closed sub variety but the point is that the image of pi hat which a priori is only uh, sub variety of this is in fact all of it so pi hat will be on to a closed sub variety and uh, this closed sub variety is independent 
of n and the choice of the QIs in the sense, suppose, so I have X and I have uh, one pi hat and I have pi hat prime uh, into CN prime CN and the image I call uh, uh, Y1 and here I call, uh, sorry, Y and here I call Y prime. So these are the close sub varieties given by the two choices. So let me call this pi, let me call this pi prime. But the point is there is a natural, there is a basically a unique isomorphism between these close sub varieties, which makes these, this outer diagram commute. So in other words, Y itself as an abstract affine variety is well-defined. And so Y equal to Y prime, and I call that X mod G. Okay, and then we will come to the, so <clears throat> this is a good quotient. So this is the first, one of the, uh, one of the postponed businesses because I tried to uh, evade my responsibility of defining this, but I was uh, put on the spot. So today I will, I will indeed define the notion of a good, good quotient, not immediately. Okay. Now, <clears throat> a special case is when X is V, a vector space, and G acting on V is linear, linear action. And so this is a special case from which the above, ca above case follows rather easily. What I mean is all the claims about good quotient, existence, etc., uh, the finite generation that I made above, if I prove in this special case, then there are, there, there are, there, there are, there are somewhat you know, easy arguments which will give the general case of uh, a, a reductive group acting on an affine variety, which need not be a vector space, okay? So let's recall the special case, which is also important for us because uh, it is in terms of the linear action that we will define projective quotients and semi-stability, okay? So, uh, so the special case now, as I said, G acting on B vector space and the action is linear. <clears throat> so, in this case, you let I inside CV be the ideal uh, given by invariant polynomials by homogeneous invariant polynomials of positive degree. Now this is a since it's it's given by homogeneous polynomials, the corresponding variety which I call n for the uh, nil, uh, what null cone uh, variety or scheme defined by i is invariant under scalar multiplication. In other words, is a cone through the origin. So we, we note that for future use. So I have I contained in B, a cone. <clears throat> now, and I is finitely generated by Hilbert basis theorem. So there exists homogeneous polynomials Q1 to Qn such that I is uh, generated by Q1 to Qn in 
CX. CV. So, <clears throat> Now, so here I don't necessarily use that G is linearly reductive. G linearly reductive implies uh, C V G is C Q one Q one. The same <coughs> a choice of generators for the ideal gives you a choice of. Uh, generators for the invariant ring. So this, so this is, the, this is the, in some sense, the main theorem of characteristic zero invariant theory. Uh, let us uh, agree that for future use, these are homogeneous of degree Q1, Qn, degree D1 to Dn. Please, and let's put them, order them like this. So the proof uses the Reynolds operator. So Reynolds name ends with the S, so the apostrophe comes after the S. So this, uh, so I didn't mention Reynolds operator except under compulsion in the last lecture. So I'm mentioning it explicitly. And in fact, I will uh, I, um, spend, uh, this is one of the things I'll deal with because it, it's an important, uh, it's so easy to define and use. This proof is, you know, it's two lines, you'll see. Um, uh, and I, I think uh, if you're going to do anything at all in characteristic zero uh, invariant theory, uh, you, you should know your way around the Reynolds operator. So it, I, I need to spend time on this. So this is the second thing I will spend time on. Then uh, I defined the set of semi-stable points in a sort of backhanded way by taking the projective space of V. And since N is a conical subset, I can projectivize it. In other words, I, I just take the projective space of V which is uh, the set of one dimensional subspaces of V and just remove the one dimensional subspaces which, which, which lie entirely in N. Remember that if, if I take any non-zero point of uh, N, all the whole subspace, one dimensional subspace uh, spanned by that point is in N. So I can, so N defines a subset of PV. And in fact, since N is a closed conical subset of V, P, P n is a closed subvariety of projective space. So I remove that, and what I get is a Zariski open subset called the semi set of semi stable points. So explicitly, the point. V in PV. So the notation is V is a vector in V and it's non zero. And that determines a point in PV. And given a point in PV, it, there is a vector in V which unique up to scalar multiplication. So one goes back and forth between these two notations. So is semi stable if if and only if there exists Q homogeneous invariant degree bigger than zero, such that Q evaluated at the vector V is non-zero. So this is just a recasting of this, but this is the conventional uh, definition of semi-stable points. And uh, yeah, 
Uh, then very quickly, I, 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 I said, look at uh, PVSS, which is PV minus PN. Uh, there is a map from V with the null cone, null cone removed, which is just the C star quotient. Uh, this maps to uh, V mod G minus uh, the vertex. Remember the vertex is the, just the image of the origin. Of the origin of V. V mod G is the analog of, is the, uh, yeah. Um, and uh, from here, I have, I, so there is a C star action on V mod G. So I, I can take the corresponding quotient, which is also uh, the proj of the graded ring of invariance. So if you know what that is, I, I will not. Uh, I think for the moment, you can just think of this as uh, the C star quotient of this, okay? And this in induces a map like this, which I called pi p, this is pi. And then I said that this is a good quotient. So good quotient is appearing again, and I, and, and I should define the notion. Uh, now, uh, so and the the last thing that I need to uh, un unfinished business is what are stable points. Okay. Uh, so let me deal with unfinished business one by one. So one is Reynolds operator. So I, I will define it in the uh, in, in the general case of an affine variety. So, so G acting on uh, on X. So <clears throat> then I have the regular functions on X, and within that I have the um, uh, invariant functions, and uh, the, the 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 fact is fact. Since G is linearly reductive, there exists a projection R from C X to CXG. So this is, look, this is a C vector space. This, this is an inclusion of C vector spaces. And by a project, so the, by a projection, I mean a projection from a vector space to a subspace. Okay, there is nothing more to it. You, these are infinite dimensional spaces in general, but uh, you know, there's nothing to stop me. So, but you know, we are not, we don't talk about norms or bounded, et cetera, et cetera. This is just a this is just a map between the regular functions here to regular functions here. So such that R of P Q is R of P times Q if Q is invariant. In other words, if I take an invariant, invariant regular function, multiply it by, by an arbitrary regular function, and then project back to this, uh, the same, it is the same if, you know, you, the Q just comes out. It's linear over, so this is a, so, so see, in fancy language, this is a module over the subring, and this map is a module, uh, is, a, is, is a module map with respect to, uh, the, this subring. Okay. Uh, see, so the, the case to think of is when the group G is finite, in which case uh, this map R is just averaging over orbits of the group. So you just take any, any, so how do I get a function on a space invariant under a finite group? Take any function, take all its translates under all the elements of the group, take the sum, and divide by the order of the group, and uh, that gives you the projection. Okay, 
And it, it, so this essentially the same idea works uh, for a reductive group, except you, instead of averaging over the, the group, you average, you average over the maximal compact subgroup of the group. You just integrate over the maximal compact. Very good. So this is the so this is the Reynolds operator. And the important property is this. So now how do we use to use it to prove uh, finite generation in the case of a, a, a of a vector? So 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 consider the case. Um, x equal to b and g acting on this is linear. So in this case, <clears throat> you see uh, both r and rg are, uh, so cx, cb is r and cb, g I call rg. So both of these are graded Both of these are C constants. And the Reynolds operator acts degree by degree. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, it's built out of these. Uh, it, it, averaging doesn't change the degree of a polynomial. So now, um, so, uh, so I have, <clears throat> I have R, I have within that I have RG. And uh, once I choose a, a set of generators for the ideal, uh, Q1 to Qn as before, of degree D1 less than or equal to Dn as before, I have the subring generated by Q1 to Qn here. And I want to show that this is actually equal. That is what you want to show. Okay, now suppose not there. Ex so let let uh, Q be the the uh, invariant polynomial of minimal degree. which lies outside C Q1 to Qn, okay? So supposing there is a, a Q which belongs here, but is not contained here. Now think of Q, uh, I mean, so you can easily arrange that Q is actually homogeneous and is, Q is homogeneous of, 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 uh, of positive degree, so this is certainly belongs to the ideal generated by Q1 to Qn. So Q is of the form uh, P1 Q1 plus P2 Q2 plus Pn Qn. Now apply the Reynolds operator to both sides. Now, since Q is uh, invariant, this is equal to Q and now from here, you will get RP1Q1 plus RP2Q2 RPNQ1. Okay. Um, right. Um, now, you see, um, yeah. Now, the degree of this guy is strictly less than the degree of Q because degree of Q1 is positive, okay? So degree of this is strictly less than, uh, see degree of this plus degree of this is degree of Q. So, and since the degree of this is positive, degree of P1 is strictly less than degree of Q. So, um, uh, so this means that RP1 uh, is already in the, in, uh, by our assumption, is a polynomial in the Q1 to Qn. And similarly, these guys. So uh, you have a contradiction. This can be 
perhaps made slicker, but this is the essential idea of uh, finite generation of invariants. For the linear case, once you have the Reynolds operator to hand. So that was the first thing that I had to do, uh, which I had promised I would do. Then what is a good quotient? So if I have a uh, algebraic group acting on X, so the, no the notion can be defined in this generality, but uh, I'm not confident that, uh, uh, yeah, some of the things that we get, we are so used to assuming for good quotients with reductive groups may not uh, hold, but let me just say what the thing is. Then uh, good quotient, is a map x y to y uh, such that so by a by map of varieties so it's a morphism of varieties such that pi of g x equal to pi of x two pi is on two three pi is a categorical quotient i.e. for any y prime and map y prime x to y prime such that pi of x uh, g x put to pi prime x uh, it factorizes so like this. So it's universal for such maps for pi is an affine morphism i.e. for any u in y open pi inverse of u so open affine is affine. Phi for such u as above, c of u is c of phi inverse of u g invariants. Let me list the properties and then uh, come back and say a few words about them. Given x prime in S closed G invariant, phi of x prime in Y is closed. Seven given x prime, x double prime in X closed G invariant, x prime in this section, x double prime mt, phi of x prime in the section pi of x double prime is empty. Okay, so unless I have uh, forgotten something, these are all the properties of a good quotient. These are as good as you can get, except the, what one would one is missing is that the points of y are in bijection with group orbits. So a good quotient doesn't quite parameterize g orbits, but everything short of that you get. Uh, it is uh, it, it, the good quotient uh, takes orbits to points. Uh, in fact, the points of the quotient are in bijection with closed orbits in X. That takes a little more work. Phi is a categorical quotient. Phi is an affine morphism. So, and locally, it looks like uh, the kind of quotients we have constructed. Namely, take affine open sets, take the ring of invariants, that's they are, they are finitely generated, take the corresponding uh, variety. So locally over Y, it is exactly the kind of quotients we have constructed. Uh, and uh, given any closed G invariant set, its image is closed and G invariant. 
and disjoint closed invariant sets map into disjoint uh, closed sets in the base. And all the quotients that we have seen are good quotients. Uh, so this is the setup when you have uh, a deductive group acting on an affine variety or even a project. So, so the important thing is that now let me go back to the positive quotient and say a bunch of stuff. Yeah. So, so, let, so since see much of the rest of the lectures will be taken up with uh, this situation. So I think we should take a deep breath and concentrate on this. Uh, that's because much as you would like to work with the linear situation, uh, working with the projective variety, uh, projective space uh, gives you access to more analytical tools. Uh, in particular, the projective space is compact. And uh, so the formalism of the moment map, uh, everything up applies much better to the projective space. See, <clears throat> and having once established it there, you can uh, translate many of these things back to the vector space, but I myself am not familiar with it. And I think it's a clumsy translation. So in any case, so let us, this is what uh, we have to deal with. So, okay, let me repeat. So before I do that, so now I'm, let me take a deep breath. You also take a deep breath and uh, are there questions? Uh, I have not talked about what are stable points. Somebody did ask me last time. I have put the answer into the expanded improved notes. Can I just uh, sneak that by? Yeah, I think that should be okay. Yeah? Maybe, uh, yeah. So are there any questions? Okay. I've been kind of going, going at breakneck speed because uh, it was technically a, a review. Yeah, so how, uh, so this uh, being a good quotient, the right-hand side of B mod N, V very- that, that is just specializing from that is a, B to V mod G. Correct. Correct. Okay. That, yeah. I'm just, so V to V mod G is a good quotient, and I'm mm -hmm. removing a point from E mod G and looking at the inverse. Uh, I mean, so I'm just looking at an open subset of a good quotient, an open subset of a good uh, of the good quotient. If, if I restrict, I get a good quotient because being a good quotient is local on the base. Mm -hmm. It's almost the definition of the good. Almost. Quotient. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the right hand side there is uh, really nothing. So what you have to, the easy thing, uh, things to understand are the horizontal maps, which are both C star quotients. Correct. Mm -hmm. The C star quotient upstairs is what you are, everybody is familiar with. That's how projective space is uh, defined. Correct. Mm -hmm. You take uh, the vector space, remove the origin and uh, take the quotient by C star, you get the projective space. With, so that is the same thing without the SS. But you just remove not only the origin, but you remove the whole nilpotent cone on the right. Mm. Therefore, on the left, you don't get all of projective space. You get the projective space with the projective-wise nilpotent cone removed from it. Mm. So that is the Zadisky open subset, semi-stable points of the projective space. Mm. Okay, so that I have just explained the top left leftward arrow. Sorry. Mm. Uh, Okay, now there is a bottom left, leftward arrow that you have to understand. In particular, the see the, the 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 really sort of subtle thing here, which I have kind of smuggled in, is this object called P V V over G. Hmm. Okay, so that is the that that its its relationship with uh, V double uh, quotient G. Hmm. is the same as the relationship of PV with uh, V. Okay. Hmm. So, the, so let me recall for you, because the ring of invariance is graded, hmm. that means that the ring of functions on V mod G is a graded ring. 
there is an induced action of C star on the variety V mod G, which fixes the vertex new. Hmm. Vertex, recall, is the image of the origin above. So Correct. the map pi has the property that uh, pi of T x is T of pi x. T of pi x. Okay, where uh, uh, T is in C star. Hmm. Okay, so so the, the, the C star acts here, C star acts here, C star fixes the vertex below, and uh, it fixes uh, it. The, the origin and in fact it takes um, uh, the nilpotent cone to itself so it takes a complement of the nilpotent cone to itself okay, hmm. okay. Hmm. and if i take the quotient of above i get this object hmm. yeah now hmm. if i take the quotient below i get a projective variety uh, this that is what i am i'm asking you to believe hmm. i can make that explicit if you uh, uh, but why, why do you say I'm asking you to believe it? Uh, why is it not obvious? Because you, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just lost. Well, well, you don't know what it is. No, see, because this is a somewhat. Remember, this is a this is not a vector space. Uh -huh. this is ah, a, okay. This is a, correct, correct. See, this is a variety uh, with a C star action. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, taking a variety with a C star action, removing a point that's fixed under the C star action, and taking the quotient of what is left by C star. So, you know, it, it is a somewhat subtle business. Okay. Because you get a set, all right, but that, 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 that set should have an algebraic structure, and that structure is that of a projective variety. All that is. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Is, okay. okay? But mm -hmm. so believe that for the moment. Then, because this is a good quotient, and almost automatically uh, you will get a map like this. And then, because this is a good quotient, you will get a map like this. Okay, so this map comes more or less for free, but that this is a good quotient still needs some work. Uh, in fact, this approach for constructing these quotient. Is uh, is familiar to many people, but it is more most clearly used in some lecture notes of Narsimans. Okay, uh, but this is the key object to study now, and it's worth spending enough time so that at least the people who are seriously interested have time to assimilate what I'm saying. So why don't I spend a little more time convincing you uh, so that you get a bit used to this object here? Shall I do that? Yeah. Because it is a crucial bit of the picture. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so let me do that. Okay, let's do that. Understanding P, B, more G, and the map Phi P. Okay. So remember that uh, I have this picture, G is acting here, it's a vector space, and uh, in, uh, RG is generated by invariant polynomials, invariant homogeneous polynomials, Q1 to Qn of degrees D1 to Dn, Greater than equal to one. Okay, so I have this map V to V mod G X going to Q one X Q one X. <clears throat> yeah. Now. Um, So, uh, so, so this, yeah. So this, this actually into CN, but it lands inside this. Okay, the map is X going to Q1X, Q1X. 
but it lands inside some uh, sub variety of this. Okay. Now note. Uh, so let me call this. This is called pi, and this let me call this pi hat. Pi hat x is q one x q n x. Now, what is pi hat of t x? It is q one of t x q n of t x. But q i is are homogeneous of degree d one to d n. So that means that this is t to, to the d1 q1x, t to the dn qnx. Okay. So <clears throat> so so uh, if I now remove v minus uh, uh, n mapping to uh, D mod G minus the vertex that maps to C n minus uh, zero. Yeah. So now, <clears throat> now take the quotient. So this goes to P V minus P n. This is the C star quotient. And then I have the C star quotient here. That is what I call V mod G. And so I have to take the C star quotient here also, but here the C star quotient is acting not uh, ah. the same uh, in all the coordinates. Degree is different. The first coordinates gets multi multiplied by T to the D1, et cetera, et cetera. So if I take uh, a number of weights like this and take uh, Cn and take the quotient, this is what I what is called the weighted projective space n minus one with weights d one to d n, and this is contained uh, here. And this will be a closed embedding, so closed sub variety of the weighted projective space. And so so this map pi. So this is what I call pi hat. Uh, this induces pi p. Uh, so so this you see how the uh, this somewhat abstract projective quotient of this by this is embedded comes uh, just as uh, the affine quotient gets embedded uh, in cn by the relations between the qis the projective quotient gets embedded in the weighted projective space precisely by the same relations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, correct. So, uh, and uh, the, the point is, even though the usual projective space is a nice singular variety, uh, the non singular variety, non -singular. weighted projective spaces in general are singular. And uh, this is, in, in, in addition, this is a sub variety. So, they, this could have singularities coming by its own intrinsic nature. And also, by remember that the embedding that it comes with is also into a singular projective version of projective space. Okay. 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 I mean, hmm. but the key thing is that at least this is embedded in some nice uh, projective object. Weighted hmm. projective spaces are projective space, projective varieties. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Uh, very good. Uh, so now I will. Uh, okay, now. Uh, so let me. Uh, I could say a bunch of stuff about stable points and orbits and so on, but I think uh, let's do something lighter, and which also sneaks forward, uh, uh, sort of gives a sneak peek into what's coming coming ahead, which is numerical measures. Of semi stability. So, uh, um, in the next lecture, uh, I will deal with the moment map. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I may, I should, I, I think, spend some time already today breaking the ice with the moment map. But before, before, because that is going to be heavy and full of definitions, there is no way around it. Uh, so, but before we head there, 
let us do something light. Okay. So now I'm going to so state a theorem, uh, which is really not difficult, but nonetheless not entirely obvious, which is the starting point of this. And I, this is, uh, maybe this was known to others, but this is the starting point of the work of Kempf and Neff. Kempf and Ness. Okay. So let us look at the G acting on the complex vector space, linear action. G is reductive. Okay. So now we have to introduce something that algebra is typically don't like, uh, which is uh, a complex uh, Hermitian in a product. So, so you see, whenever a linear group, uh, algebraic group, group acts on a vector space, uh, you get a map from G into GLV. GLV. Mm -hmm. And we are assuming that the, uh, the action is uh, effective. Uh, so let's assume that this is actually an injective map. Okay, so. So the moment I choose an inner product on, uh, on a vector space, uh, there exists, there comes, uh, there, um, we get a, a subgroup of GLV uh, called UV, the unitary uh, endomorphisms. And this is actually a maximal compact I should say a maximal compact subgroup of GLV. So every uh, linear algebraic group uh, over C has a maximal compact subgroup. Um, and in the case of, uh, I mean, these are not unique, but they are sort of almost unique uh, you know, to conjugation. And uh, uh, reduct. Reductive groups are characterized by the fact that these maximal compact guys are uh, Zariski dense in the uh, in the big group. Okay, so now this introduce this induces. If I take the intersection of this with this, this gives me a maximal compact for K. And actually, this in in some sense, this is the uh, more intrinsic choice that you make. But uh, let us not worry about being intrinsic and so on. So let us do this. The point is, once we have an inner product on B, we have the notion of the length of a vector, distances between vectors. These are well defined. And uh, so now comes a really small lemma, which is the starting point. And I, I will start. I will just say it uh, because this is the kind of introduction of a numerical measure into this theory, which I think finds its full expression in the moment map and its norm. And so, yeah, just one small question. Yeah. Yeah, so how K is defined here? Just as the intersection of U, V with G. So I assume that G is, uh, uh, is injecting into GLV. So I just define K to be the intersection of U, V with K. The G. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's injective, so it's okay. Yeah. 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 So here is a lemma. Uh, so take a vector, non zero vector in uh, B. Then B is semi stable if and only if in. Uh, G V norm G in G is bigger than zero. Bigger than zero. Okay. So you are uh, so take um, take the uh, um, take the orbit of a of of a vector. 
if the infimum uh, of the length of vectors along the orbit is strictly bigger than zero, uh, then the corresponding point in projective space is semi-stable uh, with respect to the action of G on projective space. So as I said, so this is quite easy to prove, but there is a little little point here. Okay. So let's prove this, and this is about the only. And then once I do this, I'm going to sort of leave this behind and uh, begin the uh, sort of heavy work of introducing the moment map to you, because there is no. I, I've taken it on myself that that is my main task. Um, okay. So I hope I get this right, because this is one of those things that's really easy. So, so you kind of semi-prepare and, and then hope to wing it. Uh, OK. Uh, so um, yeah, so uh, if, uh, yeah, so, so suppose first, suppose V is semi-stable, then there exists Q uh, homogeneous degree bigger than zero and invariant such that Q of V is uh, non zero. If uh, in GV G in G is zero, there exists GI in G such that GIV uh, goes to zero. Zero V, right? If the if I have uh, if, if the infimum of this is zero, there exists a sequence of GI so that the, the, the lengths of GIV go to zero. That means that the vectors go to zero. Um, uh, this, this implies Q of GIV goes to zero since Q, after all, Q is a polynomial since Q is continuous, okay? But this is Q of V because Q is, uh, since Q is invariant. Contradiction. Okay. So this is the, okay. Now this is the sort of quote unquote easy direction. Is that clear? I mean, this is a very simple argument, but uh, uh, I hope everybody is following it. If following this, if, because if you're not following this, then I'm- No, no, I think it's a failure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, this looks okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. let me so let me repeat. So supposing V is semi-stable, by definition, this means there exists a homogeneous polynomial of degree bigger than zero, which is invariant, which when evaluated on the vector V is non-zero. Right? right. Remember that uh, so, so that was my translation of semi-stability right at the beginning. Okay. Hmm. Now, suppose that infimum of uh, the lengths of vectors along the G orbit is actually zero. That means there exists GI in G such so that uh, the lengths of GIV go to zero. Now, if I, if I have a sequence of vectors in a, in a norm vector space such so that the lengths go to zero, that means that the vectors themselves go to zero. With respect to go to zero, meaning go to zero in the topology of uh, given by the distance. But Q is a polynomial function. So it is actually continuous with respect to the topology given by the distance. Therefore, Q GIV must go to zero. But on the other hand, Q is invariant. Uh, the values of Q don't change as, a, as GI change because Q is a, a G invariant. So this is, these are all equal to QV, which is non-zero to start with. So, a con so this is actually a constant, uh, this is a family of constant elements of uh, the complex numbers. So uh, constant, non-zero constant. So it, it can't go to zero. 
Okay, I, I, I succeeded in making that uh, simple argument come apart in my mouth. But anyways, uh, okay, now let's go the other direction because that requires a little more work. Uh, so I will say something and then uh, let's see if anybody spots, uh, spots a problem. Uh, now the converse. Since uh, in Tx greater than zero, Gx closure does not contain the origin. Because if, if right, if the, if the closure contained the origin, the, uh, there would be a sequence of points uh, that, that would, uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the orbit that would go to the origin, then, then this would contradict this. So now I have the origin and I have the closure. And these are two G invariant closed subsets. So I can find some function. Uh, so Q, uh, so, so let me call that P. So that P uh, here is one, G X bar is one, and P of zero V is zero. And I can find some polynomial so that this is true. Uh, and then I apply the Reynolds operator to get an invariant polynomial RP uh, says so that uh, this GX would be equal to one. And um, RQ, RP uh, here is one zero and um, so I, I would have exhibited a polynomial that proves semi-stability of uh, X. Now, the, the little where I've kind of pulled a fast one on you is that uh, this argument applies with the closure with respect to the uh, distance topology. And this argument needs- There is a remark in the- yeah, okay. So here, so going from here to this, I can only conclude with respect to the closure with respect to the distance topology, whereas this argument needs to work with the closure with respect to the Zariski topology. Okay. Because it, 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 only when I have two disjoint Zariski close sub, subsets of a variety, can I find a polynomial that takes the value one on one and zero on the other. A regular function. See, regular functions uh, have this property. On an affine variety, do have this property. So, so the first one I have pulled is to conflate the closure with respect to the distance topology with the closure with respect to the Zariski topology. So, so if I so uh, so in general, these are very different objects. If I take uh, the open unit disk in C, its closure with respect to the distance topology is a closed unit disk. Its closure with respect to the Zariski topology is all of C. Okay, so it's a much bigger set. So it could happen that zero is not contained in the closure with respect to the distance topology, but is, is actually contained in the closure with respect to the Zariski topology. Fortunately, if I take uh, uh, algebraic group acting on a variety, then uh, there are theorems that guarantee that uh, the closure with respect to the, this is the, one of the basic theorems due to Borel that uh, closure with respect to the classical topology and the closure with respect to the Zariski topology coincide. Okay, so, uh, so that is the proof of this lemma. Yeah, so are there questions? 
the, you know, this is not the, I will put in the details in the notes, but this is the spirit of the, of the argument and the, 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 the subtle point that you have to, is I, I have really noted here. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yes, that is, this is the point. Uh, that's, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the point is that uh, the, uh, the orbit of an algebraic group is a constructible set. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so now, uh, having gotten a taste of what uh, introducing metrics can give us, let me now go over uh, KV. Now I have to. I have two choices. I can wind up, or I can give start a little bit mo mo moment map, and that will need me to introduce notions of symplectic geometry. Oh yes. Oh my God. I was supposed to do examples. Ah. So why don't I? Okay. Let, so, yeah. I will post, I'll I'll do post some examples and then start. Next. I will do examples. Okay, so can I take 10 minutes? Okay. Yeah. Huh? Can I take 10? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I suppose I, I hope I'm speaking for everyone, but I think it's okay. Yeah. yeah. So I will, I will not uh, even say anything about the moment map examples. Okay. So one, V is C2 and G is S2 the symmetric group uh, of permutations of the coordinates x and y. Then r is cxy and rg is uh, c x plus y xy. And the map, uh, uh, the quotient map is c2 to c2 given by xy into x plus y xy. Note that here, here already you see that uh, these are, the quotient map is given by two polynomials of different degrees. So, so, if, so Q1 xy is x plus y and Q2 xy is xy. So now every point is actually semi-stable. Every non-zero vector is a semi-stable. Uh, so if I look at the corresponding map for projective space, the map is P1 to P1. So this is, okay, I, I, let me not, uh, yeah. It's, it's instructive to see what the projective quotient is. Uh, v is the space of N by N matrices. A. G is SL and C. And uh, G acts on V by conjugation. Uh, then R is a polynomial ring. So, uh, because it's just a ring of functions on the vector space of n by n matrices, it's just polynomials in the entries of the matrix. matrix. And uh, uh, the quotient map uh, is the map from V to Cn given by A mapping to P1 A, P and A. Where these are the coefficients of the characteristic polynomials. So, in fact, here the quotient is a vector space. So, this is Mn. So GIT quotient of n by n matrices by uh, conjugation by SL and C is actually a vector space CN. Uh, but what is the null cone? 
is a such that all coefficients vanish. These are precisely single potent matrices. So, so just to understand the null cone a little better, if n equal to two, n is contained in uh, m m two. So this is four dimensions, and this is actually defined by a says that trace of a is zero, and uh, dit of a is zero. So. Uh, you know, it's it's it. Uh, so this gives you um, uh, three. So the first condition cuts down this four dimensions to three. So it gives you a three-dimensional subspace, and this is a, a quadric cone in the three-dimensional subspace. So the whole thing, this is a uh, affine uh, surface. So affine cone of dimension two. By the way. Coming back to this case, the, the null cone is uh, in this case given by x plus y equal to zero and x y equal to zero. It's, this, is, this is the, uh, as a variety, it is just the origin in C2, but you notice it's not reduced. Then here is a more interesting example. Uh, SL2C, let it act on the left M uh, two by four. So two by four matrices, left action. Uh, so the ring of invariance Is generated by the six two by two minus. So I have uh, an element here is a is a matrix uh, with four columns and two rows. And so there are two there are six two by two minus, and uh, I mean so clearly the these are invariant by multiplication on the left. So in other words, x1, x2, x3, x4, y1, y2, y3, y4. So these six functions, x1, y2, minus x2, y1, et cetera, et cetera. There are six of them. These are all invariant under the left action by SL2C, and they, in fact, generate um, uh, the, the invariant functions. But there is a one uh, quadratic, quad, quadratic relation between these, these guys. So the image is, is a quadric cone in C6. Uh, and the projective quotient is in fact, so this is a good exercise for you, can be identified with the Grassmannian of two planes, which naturally gets embedded in P5. Okay, so I will uh, stop with this. These are all uh, not difficult. I think the last exercise is particularly interesting. Uh, uh, we identify the semi-stable points for the action of uh, SL2C on the projective space of two by four matrices and prove that the quotient can be identified with the Grassmannian of, of two dimensional subspaces of uh, C4, which has a well-known embedding in P5. And this, um, uh, Embedding is actually what you get if you follow that commutative diagram and everything that we did today.
okay so in this case yeah so yeah. in this case thankfully all these invariants are of the same degree so there is no that's right that's, space that, is, that, that, is that you need that to that is why you get a non singular that's one of the reasons you get a non singular correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. yeah yeah